Uh, uh, hello, good morning, hope you're okay. Yeah, we'll soon sort that out. All right. It's good to see you, it is good to be part of it. Uh, my name's Dave Cook, my gorgeous wife, Sarah, come on, give us a... Uh, come on, stand, stand, all right. Now, now I'm feeling like Bruce Forsyth. Go on, give us a 12, love, give us a 12. That's for everybody who's over a certain age. Anyway, uh, good morning. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I'd like you to turn with me to 1 Samuel 17. Okay? In your Bibles, in your notebooks, in your electronic devices... I'd like you to turn there. Before, got some water. It's out of breath from that run. I'm not saying that it was far, but... Take a bit of your breath. Okay. I'd like you to start with me. Oh, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. Hmm. There's something wrong here. <laughs> Let's start with... Let's see if we can do this. Right. I'm going to start by asking you to uh, join with me. Okay? The Bible says that the Word of God is a seed into our hearts, yes? Yes? Yeah, yeah and it gets scattered. Yeah. Now, you can understand with me, I don't mind a bit of feedback. Don't mind a bit of encouragement. All right? All right? Right, good. You're encouraging number one. And, and, and if I point to you, you need to encourage, right? right? But the Bible says the Word of God is a seed into our hearts. Yeah. And it also says you can have good soil, rocky soil, yeah. which is what we heard, rocky soil. Yeah. Right? We have a, a different types there, with the thorns and the thistles. That's soil, yes? Yeah. Yeah. So let's make the, uh, the soil good in our hearts this morning. So, Father God, would you make the soil of my heart right and ready for your word? Not only that it just bounce off and go into, the, uh, into my brain, but never actually hit my spirit. But, Lord, will you make the soil of my heart ready for your word to make a change within me? In Jesus' name. Amen. Is that good? It's a good declaration to start with, isn't it? Right. Some, some people have obviously heard how long I preach. Because Dave's got sandwiches, and he's got cake, and he's got uh, um, uh, min Mentos and sweeties, haven't you? Yeah, he has. He obviously, he obviously heard that I've, I've preached in Africa, and if you preach for less than two hours, they think you're only drawing breath. Anyway. <sighs> there we go. So, as you are finding that scripture, as we are preparing to... Allow God to make a difference in our hearts. I'd like to tell you a story. A man and a wife, the man heard, that, uh, remembered, or should have remembered, that his wife was having a birthday. So he goes to her and he asks, excuse me, what do you want for your birthday? He says, thinks about it and says, do you know what? I'd love to be eight again. Oh, so he thinks about it. The morning of, of her birthday, he gets her up early, bowl of cocoa pops, right? <laughs> Make sure that there was uh, enough time to get to Creeley, right? So they get to Creeley and she goes on every single ride. So the, you've got the, the tornado roller coaster, you've got the monster screaming roller coaster, you've got the wall of death, the fear of this, the fear of that. So she finishes that and then he takes her around the petting zoo. And after petting every single tiny animal on the planet, finishes the day. So she thinks, oh, fantastic. So he rushes her off to McDonald's. Right, and what does he what does he get her? Happy. A happy meal. See, I told you you got to join in. Yeah. He gets her a happy meal, but he makes sure there's extra fries and a big, thick chocolate shake. Yeah. So, so she's filled up with all of that. So what happened? Takes her to the movies. The latest Star Wars movie is on. So she she gets hot dog and popcorn and as much diet coke as she wants. Amazing. End of the night, he's uh, a wobbly leg, taking her back home, putting her into bed and says, there you are, darling. Brushes the hair away from her face, says, 
So, what was it like to be eight again? She looks up at him. Stony faced. I meant dress size, you pillock. <laughs> the moral of the story, he may be listening, but he's still going to get it wrong. <laughs> now you're thinking, I wasn't coming here for a comedy show. No, you're not. <laughs> but what I'm going to tell you is you've just got used to how I pronounce things, how my voice works. Where in tonight, You also re realise I write like really cheesy, stupid jokes. Right? But that's okay. You can tell me all of them later, and we will laugh together. So this morning, have we got the... We've got two things we're going to talk about. Covenant children, covenant warriors. Is that good? I'm a covenant child. I'm a covenant child. I'm a covenant warrior. And so to look at this, we're going to look in a moment at 1 Samuel 17. Don't look yet. Okay. You're going to see some words up here. I'm sorry, I didn't know how well the font size would work. So I'm going to make sure I read the stuff as well. Is that okay, everybody? Okay. Okay. Um, when we look at preaching, I like to lay a foundational truth. Get a foundational truth from the Bible and then build on it for our uh, everyday life. Is that right? Yeah. Good encourager, number one. Brilliant. Yeah. You're, you're going to get a gold star later. Oh, wow. <laughs> if, if any of you have ever di dipped into the Bible Project, anybody here heard of the Bible Project? One, two. I thought you would, Chris. You're like that kind of bloke. You're that kind of lady. Hey! In that case, apple don't fall far from the tree. So I'd like you to uh, uh, think about writing down in your notes the Bible Project. It is fantastic. It's an online free resource for all those uh, Christians who want to uh, hook into it. They do podcasts, they do online lectures, they do online everything, and it's completely free. All right? So the, it's called the Bible Project. It's really good. So when they're talking about covenant, they, they gave a statement, and I'm just going to read out this statement to start with. Yeah, if you can read it, that's great. If not, it's bigger up there. We don't talk about covenants today, but we should. Covenants are one of the most important themes in the Bible. They are the key to God's redemptive plan to restore humanity to its divine calling. Starting in Genesis, God enters into a formal partnership, a covenant, after, uh, one after another, with various humans in order to rescue the world. These divine human partnerships, covenants, drive the narrative forward, forward until it reached the climax, the pinnacle, in Jesus. You with me, everybody? Amen. Okay? It reaches the pinnacle in Jesus. To tell the story of God's redeeming humanity through Jesus is to tell the story of God's covenant relationship with human beings. Amen. You have a covenant. If you've asked Jesus into your life, you have a covenant relationship with the Father. Yeah, yeah you with me? You're a covenant child. You're going to say it with me. I am a covenant child. You're going to have a lot of that this morning. You're going to join with me in reminding. The Bible says, uh, the funny thing is about Hebrews, in Hebrew, sorry. Uh, to learn by heart is the same phrase as to learn by mouth. Now, let that sink in. We learn the truth of the Bible by speaking it out. Yeah. It doesn't just stay here because we're speaking out into our spirits. So suddenly to learn by heart is to learn by mouth. When we learn by mouth, we repeat the words, we repeat the words, we repeat the words, and it goes into our spirits because it has that power. You good? So when I ask you to say, I, I am a covenant child, you're learning to get it into your heart. So it, do, it doesn't become a second thought, it's a first thought. I'm a covenant child. I am a covenant child. 
But what is a covenant? No. It's a good question. We just said we're covenant children. If we don't understand what a covenant is, we're kind of stuffed, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Next. 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 What is a covenant? A covenant, this is again from the Bible Project. A covenant is a relationship between two parties who make a binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. They're often accompanied by oaths, signs, and ceremonies. Covenants define obligations and commitments. You know you've got an obligation in this covenant. You know you've got a commitment in this covenant. And so does the Heavenly Father. His obligations are spelled out in the Word. His commitments to us are spelt out in the Word. Amazing, isn't it? So, covenants define obligations and commitments, but they are different from a contract. Okay? You can have a contract of employment, you can have a contract for your house, but they are different. And the reason being, the contract between, because they are relational and personal. Does that make sense? It's not a legal thing where you sign here. It's much deeper and much more committing than that. Personal relationship, a personal relationship defines that. Think of a marriage. A husband and wife choose to enter into a formal relationship, binding themselves to one another in lifelong faithfulness and devotion, and then work as partners to reach a common goal like building a life or raising children together. Now, I'm not naive. I know that there are people in this room who have been in relationships and marriages that that has not worked out for. But it doesn't mean we change or stop entering into that covenant relationship with God because one covenant has failed. Is that good? Is that true? Yeah? I know it's a bit deep, that, to start with, but we've got to get the foundations, which means you've got to dig out the dirt, haven't you? Put the foundations in, you've got to dig out the dirt. So suddenly... Suddenly we talk, uh, talk about marriage as a, a covenant. I've been married to my beautiful wife, go on, stand up, give us 12, uh, for, for uh, almost 27 years. Yeah? And I love her more today than I did when I first met her. Because the covenant relationship that we have also spills out in every area that we're involved with. Every area. You are receiving this morning from our covenant relationship. Because the foundation that we have within our lives. You are receiving water from the well of salvation that's within our hearts because it comes out of that covenant. I don't know why I started on that, but let's go there. There are five major covenants in the Bible. There's Noah, where God will never wipe out mankind by flooding the earth again. And he promises with a rainbow. There's Abraham, who chooses a family blessing through all generations. That And the covenant uh, sign for that is, anybody know? Circumcision. Right, so we'll move on from that very quickly as all the blokes cross their legs. Uh, Moses uh, with Israel, only a holy kingdom of priests that would be spread throughout the world to give glory to God and to share with all the nations, shown by the way that people live their lives in the Ten Commandments. David, the one of his descendants would reign forever, And Jesus, the new covenant, we receive forgiveness of sins and God's empowering spirit to help us live a full and self-giving love. Because of Jesus, we uh, we can live righteously and partner with him as the uh, newest of of his world. My apologies. So there you are, you have. God uh, preserves the world through Noah. And they, they build on one another. Okay? They build on one another. So it should be possibly the other way around, but you get it. God preserves the world through Noah, uh, initiates redemption through Abraham. He establishes nations of Israel through Moses, promises an eternal shepherd king through King David, yes? Yes. And then fulfilled all of his covenant promises through Jesus. You're not stuck with just one of those bits of the covenant because we live... In the new covenant, we get the lot. We get everything. 
we get all the promises. Anybody here know how many promises there are in the Bible? Is there one or two? How many? It's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm 306, actually 365, fear not. Ah. There you go. Anybody else know? We'll have a guess. North of 350. 7,474 promises. It's all right, I didn't count them all. I looked them up and I've got a book with all of them in. 7,474 promises. You have access to each and every one of them because of the covenant promise over your life. I've got a friend of mine in the house. He's coming along to give me some moral support. All right, I have. He needs just as much to know the 7,474. 74, 74. That's easy to remember, isn't it? 74, 74 promises. But what are you asking God for? Anybody read this book? Anybody seen this book? If you've seen the book, give me a wave. Anybody actually featured in it, give us a wave. You've seen this book. Do excuse me. Forgive me, Pastor. This is yesterday. What's God going to do today? What is God going to do tomorrow? We want this to be ancient history. We want to believe the covenant promises of provision for that. Come on, everybody look. See that? And it's easy to lose heart and lose vision and lose focus. But that's what we're believing God for and for the future. Am I right? Father God, we thank you for the covenant and the promises that have been made from the past. We're believing for greater. We're believing for more. We're believing for more people to fill. We're believing for more people in this place. We're believing for a new, fresh Holy Spirit empowerment of life in this place, here, today. Amen. Amen. Uh, You know how people ask you to pray for them? And you go away, oh yeah, I'll pray for you. And you never remember. I've learned something new. Somebody asks you to pray with them, pray with them then. Do it then. That's right, that's right. Good on you, man. So each covenant is built on the next. There's a. I'm going to come back to this. There's a covenant promise, isn't there, for not just this building, not just this uh, this building here, not just what you did to start with. There's a covenant promise for that. Is that? Am I right? I'm laboring on it for a moment because it's important. Because it's easy to lose heart. It's easy to lose focus. Don't lose heart. Same yesterday, today, and forever. I prefer what you just said there. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Because I can't think forever. I'm not as clever as Dan. Uh, I, 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 I did talk to him about this, and he said I should tell everybody why I wear shorts, but that's a different story. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> can't think of forever. I can think of tomorrow. He's the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Same. Same God. Okay. Yeah, Rob's looking at me. Get on with it. Okay. (laughs) So what we're going to do is we're going to take the whole chapter of 1 uh, 1 Samuel 17. I apologize. It's a bit long, but it's okay because we'll we'll break it up. And I've, I've only got two points this morning. Yeah. You're going to be incredibly annoyed because I'm preaching and speaking for that long with only two points. <laughs> Let's turn to 1 Samuel 17. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. And I may ask you to interject with whatever uh, version you have at some point. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and, and camped between Sokoth in Judah and Azekah at some unpronounceable place. 
Saul encountered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills, with the valley between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and a bronze coat of mail weighing 125 pounds. Now, scholars, uh, uh, biblical scholars have said that his clothing, uh, the helmet was shaped like a snake. And the armour had scales on it. Now, doesn't that sound familiar from the Garden of Eden? Doesn't that sound familiar from the way in which the enemy uh, uses his tactics? He also wore bronze leg armour and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and as thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds on its own. His armour bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted and taunted across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He said. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only a servant of Saul. Listen to that. You are only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy, listen to this, I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. So Goliath, taunts are similar to the taunts we get every day. We get every day things like, things will never change. We get taunts like, you're a failure. You're useless. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. These are the taunts that, I, that we, we all get. Don't waste your time following God's call or plan. It will only end in tears. Sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. You're worthless. Might as well give up in, in, uh, with the depression. You're not worthy of God's grace and mercy. Well, funnily enough, I'm not. <laughs> But these are the taunts. If they only knew what, you, what you've done in your past, they would ask you to leave. Your past is too bad. If you tell anyone about your faith, they'll laugh at you. They'll never forgive the hurts of the past. You'll never forgive them. You're addicted to sarcasm, criticism, fault-finding, complaining, and you'll never change. The diagnosis is terminal. Give into it. Your marriage is doomed. Might as well bail. You will never get out of the financial hole. Does, any, does this ring true with anybody else? Yeah. Or is it too heavy? Yeah? Good. Then Lee, this is for you this morning. Anybody else wants to? This is for me. Each week we go through stuff and this is for me. The one thing you need to understand, if a, if a sermon or a preparation for something that's shared with you on a Sunday isn't personal and coming out of the, the preacher, it's just coming out of a book. And we're not talking the Bible. Yeah? yeah? We need to be prepared for these things. The Bible calls the devil the accuser. Yeah. <sighs> he will only ever remind you of your past not your future. He will never remind you of how far you've come. Chloe, look how far you've come, love. You don't listen to the accusations and the rubbish. That's one of the reasons why I said you needed to hear this. Because you are so far from where you started. How far have you come? How far have you left the past and the enemy behind? Don't listen to the lies then. 
Don't listen to the accusations. Don't listen to the taunting morning and night. Don't listen to it. Oh. He'll never tell you about the changes you've made in the future that await you. The devil will only call you by your sins, not by your name. He'll only ever call you by the fears and the doubts and not your name. The shouts and the taunts are unworthy of place of God's family. God always calls us by our names. Come on, tell me your name. Oh, come on, you can do a bit better than that. Tell me your name. He knows you by name. Do you want to go even better? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah? He knows me by my DNA coding. He made me unique. <laughs> and you're quite grateful for that. You are unique. And he knows you by your DNA coding. How do I know this? The Bible says he knows how many hairs. He knows when you brush your hair. I lost one then. He knows exactly how many hairs there are on your head. You are special. You are unique. He knows you by your name. Now, the Bible says it very clearly in Revelations, doesn't it, Joe? It says, yes, but only those names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, we're going to take a moment. Uh, does God know you by your name? Yeah? Can we take a moment and have a praise pause and thank him for knowing us by our name? So come on, let's stand. Thank you. Come on! Thank you, Lord. You know me by my name. Thank you, Lord. Know me by my name. You know me by my name. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. The thing is, if we don't appreciate what we've got, we'll never anticipate the future. We'll never be expectant because we'll always be looking over our shoulders. You are known by your Father, your Heavenly Father, by your name. And he doesn't... The weird thing is, right? Not everybody becomes a child of God. Yes? Says those who want to be called by the... You're a child of God. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. My name, written in the Lamb's Book... Get on with it, Dave. Get on with it. <clears throat> I saw it. Sorry. Verse 11. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Did you hear that? Saul was terrified and deeply shaken. Now David was the son of a man called, uh, named Jesse, an Ephraimite from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at that time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three older sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah, had already joined um, Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David, uh, David's three older brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, every morning and every night, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army, taunting. First thing in the morning, last thing at night. That's when the enemy tries to get us. Or is that just me? That's when we need to be prepared for him. First thing in the morning, I'll just stay in bed. Might as well. Last thing at night, you know, useless. Day was po pointless. You heard that? You are a covenant child. Just to give you some context, don't look this up at the moment. When you're, when you're uh, reviewing the sermon notes this afternoon uh, and uh, talking it through with your friends and saying, God, wasn't that bloke amazingly handsome? Right. Uh, 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 you'll review it and look back at uh, 1 Samuel 16 where David is just anointed as king. So his three older brothers have been rejected not to be king. But David is the one that, they, uh, that God chose. Yeah. 
I haven't picked this because my name's David, but it'll be all right. <laughs> every morning, every night, the devil will hurl accusations and curses and taunts at us. Forty days is the time of testing. Why didn't the Israelites stop him? Because they believed what was being said. They believed the lie. They believed the false things that were coming out of Goliath's mouth. Got to shut him down. Got to shut the, uh, the accuser down. That's right. Yeah. yeah. They believed it. Because you could tell they believed it in verse 11 when it says, Saul and all the Israelites were terrified. They were terrified. The enemy's tic- uh, tactics, I put tic tacs here, the enemy's tactics <laughs> haven't changed. He uses fear and intimidation. This was Goliath's ex- exact intention to issue the challenge. The reason why he came out with full battle equipment and parade in front of the Israelite armies because he wanted them to be dismayed and greatly afraid. Yeah. Goliath defeated the Israelites with fear alone. Yeah. He hadn't done anything. The enemy has no hold on you. Is that good? Thanks, number one. First, it will keep them from ever going out to battle because they were so afraid. It's true, isn't it? Second, if they, don't, if they do come out to battle, then they've seen the fear and the apprehension of the words and the battle and the armor, and then they've already lost before they start the fight. Do you ever feel on a day like where you've lost already, but you haven't done anything? You're a covenant child. Covenant children. I am a covenant second. Right, okay. Fear, what does fear do? Paralyzes. Exactly, that's exactly the word. It stops all movement, doesn't it? Yeah. Forward and back. We get paralyzed by the fear. Yeah. What am I going to do now? How am I going to get out of this? Or is it just, I'm trying to be practical, real about this. We all face giants. We all face the nine foot giant. And it might be the nine foot giant of finance, it might be the nine foot giant of health. It might be the nine-foot giant of relationships. But we all face giants. We all hear those taunts. But what am I? I'm a covenant child. I have a relationship with the king of the universe. I have him backing me up. If you come against one of God's children, what do you think dad's going to do? But we don't actually call on God for that. We listen and we agree with the taunts and we never let go of them. I'm a covenant child. I'm called and chosen by God. Just like David of old, who was anointed to be king, he's then going into this battle. You're anointed. The Bible says you are a uh, part of a kingly priesthood. Chosen. You've chosen. I'm going to say that with me. I am chosen. chosen. These are the bits you write down and make sure that you put them on the the fridge. Because when you open up, you see, I'm chosen. I'm called by God. I'm special. I'm unique. I'm a covenant child. Oh, right. So verse 17, we're on now. Okay. It's all right, we've only got... Okay, 10 minutes. <laughs> One day Jesse said to David, take this basket of rooted uh, grain and then the 10 loaves of uh, bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. And give them to, uh, 10 cuts of cheese to the captain See how the brothers are uh, getting along and bring back a report on how they're doing. David's brothers were uh, with Saul and the Israelite army in the Valley of Elah fighting against uh, the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd 
and set out early the next morning with the gifts, as Jesse was, had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and, and battle cries. Soon the Israelites and the Philistines faced, uh, uh, forces faced each other, uh, army against army. David left the things with the keeper of the supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the ranks and David heard him shout his usual taunts as he did with the um, armies of Israel. So David arrives, he listens to Goliath and in him he says, do you know what, that doesn't line up with what I know about God. He says, he listens to the, well, I'm going to beat the living snot out of you. And he says, do you know what? That doesn't line up. That doesn't line up with what I know in the word. That doesn't line up with the covenant promise that God said I would live under. If we don't get to it because of time, right? This is a spoiler alert. Goliath dies. Okay. okay, the enemy dies. Yes, praise God, hallelujah, or even whoopee. He says, this doesn't line up. I'm an anointed, chosen child of God. This doesn't line up with what I know about the Heavenly Father. This is not what I know and and line up with what the Bible says about me, what the Torah, which was the first uh, five books of the Bible, what the Torah says the covenant promise would be for me. So that's where he turns around and says, who's going to fight him? That's why David says it. That's not me. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, people of the jury, that's not us. That is not us. We are not beaten down. We are not destroyed. We are not useless and worthless. We're covenant children. We are, sorry, go on. There you go, of the living God. And in the name of the recent prophets, the Ting Tings, that's not my name. That's for the people under a certain age. That's not my name. My name is not defeated. My name is not deadbeat. I'm not a victim. I'm not a waste of oxygen. I am a covenant child. I am a covenant child. We're so easy to listen to other opinions and not pick up the word. What does the word say about me? The word says, like Jesus said to the disciples, do you know what? I've called and chosen you. On purpose. God calls us on purpose. So I'm laboring this. Plan and a purpose. I haven't got time to go into that. Right? Don't get me sidetracked. <laughs> but the sole foundation of his covenant was his relationship with God. He didn't try and, uh, and go out with strength. No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> he didn't try and go out with uh, superior tactics. He went out in the name of the Lord. As soon as the Israelites forces uh, faced each other, armies against each other, David left the things. We got down to that, didn't we? So we're on now 24. All right. You're ahead of me, Joe. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? Have you seen the giant of finance that comes against the church, that stops the, the, the covenant? Or is that too real, too raw, too honest? The enemy is trying to stop the move of God, the church to move forward in this place. Oh, sorry. Because he tries to stop us. No. 
because we're standing not in our own ability. Because uh, anybody here uh, abs- absolutely uh, multimillionaire? <laughs> no. But God has all things. He's the one. So I was a bit... Came out each day to defy Israel. The king had offered a huge reward to anyone who would kill him. He would give the man one of the daughters for a wife. The man's entire family will be exempt from taxes. Hey! Hey! We love. Who wants to be exempt from taxes? Yes. Right, go and kill the giant for us. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will the man get? For killing the Philistine and ending this defiance, this defiance of Israel. Who is the pagan Philistine? Just so you know, what does it say in your verse, uh, version? What version you got there? Uncircumcised. Yeah. What does it say in verse 26 about the giant? It says, This is the worst insult in the whole Bible. If you're looking for insults in the Bible, this is the worst one. He says, what is going to happen for the person who gets rid of this uncircumcised Philistine? He's out of the covenant. David immediately evokes the covenant promise because I'm a circumcised, called chosen man of God. The Bible says that in the Old Testament, they circumcised... uh, There's little little children coming in. (laughs) No, they circumcised uh, uh, physically, but in the New Testament, God circumcises our hearts. Yeah? You're a covenant child because you circumcised your heart. Oh. The king was meant to fight. Earlier you find out about him that he was head and shoulders, literally head and shoulders, taller than anybody else in Israel. He should have been the champion going out. He should have been the one. But the fear gripped him. So I'm going to move on to verse 27. And these men gave David the same reply. He said, yes, that is the reward for, uh, for killing him. And when David's oldest brothers, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway? He demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. Have have your motives ever been misunderstood? (laughs) Have you ever been questioned by those who are supposed to love and trust you? People who think they know your heart. Eliab had possible motives. He said, first, he was angry because he felt David was an insignificant, worthless person. Second, he was angry because he felt he knew David's motives. He didn't, did he? Third, he was angry because he thought David tried to provoke somebody else to fight Goliath so he could watch the battle. Finally, he was angry because David was right. He was angry because David was right. I'm a covenant child. And I know time's gone. Here's the second point. When you stand against your giant, you're a covenant warrior. I'm a covenant warrior. And when you come against me, do excuse me, I know you're, Dave, you're not going to, all right, you're you're a nice bloke. You're going to share your biscuits. (laughs) <laughs> when you come against me when the enemy comes against me he's not just coming against me he's coming against the might of heaven he's coming against all of the armies the armies of Israel everything everything that God has done he's done it for you he says you are part of my family you are a covenant child you are a covenant warrior when you stand and stand and stand. And Ephesians chapter 6 says, after you have done everything to stand, stand in the armor of God. So we have to do our bit to say no. 
Submit to God, Amen. resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The bit I have to do is submit to God, Amen. then I've got to resist the devil, and he will flee from me. Because I'm standing, and I'm doing everything I can to stand in the armor of God. Yeah? So I'm a covenant child and a covenant warrior. I told you, I told you at the end of the story, just in case we didn't get there. All right? He took the head off Goliath. Didn't even have a sword. He used his. I don't know, we could go, uh, and I could carry on for another three or four hours. But, uh, what was it? The heart can only take what the bum can endure. <laughs> and this may, and, I'm, and I mean this in the nicest way, please forgive me, please forgive me, Pastor. I may never speak again in this church. Because I don't know. But what I do know is I'm looking at covenant warriors. You make covenant with God. You make covenant with one another. When we come around the table, it said, and Jesus took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And as family, we stand together. And we pray and believe and share and love and commit to one another. We, we look at uh, where we're going and we say, do you know what? God, I'm a covenant child. I'm a covenant warrior. And I will stand shoulder to shoulder with my brothers and sisters. And I, if there's anything that gets in the way, anything that gets in the way with my brother, can you stand? Can you, can you, can you stand? That's a good question. <laughs> Uh, will you stand? <laughs> will you stand? Right? Why do you think rugby scrums lock the people together? Because there's strength in numbers. Covenant warriors. Lock yourself in with the... <laughs> <laughs> With the brothers and sisters that you have around you. <laughs> We're going to finish. Thank you, Dan. There's a declaration. Final slide. Final slide. This morning's declaration. It's simple. It's not, it's not uh, really clever, because I'm a simple bloke. If, it, if it's too clever, I just don't get it. <laughs> Thanks, brother. <laughs> that makes me feel so much better. My brother, it's true. Yes. I've proved it. Yes. Good. This morning's declaration. You're going to make this declaration with me? Yes. Should we, t- should we stand and make it together? So on the count of three, we're going to make this declaration. One, two, three. I am a covenant child. I am a covenant warrior. Now turn to somebody next to you. And make the declaration right in their face. Right? I am a covenant child. I am a covenant warrior. I am a covenant child. I'm a covenant warrior. I am a covenant child. I am a covenant warrior. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to pray. Okay. (laughs) Father, we thank you for the examples of the people in the scriptures. David wasn't tall, he wasn't muscly, he wasn't uh, um, an ideal specimen for, a, uh, for walking out onto a battlefield, but he had something that everybody else didn't. Yes, amen. Oh, 
he understood his relationship with his heavenly father. And he understood that when he walked out, it didn't matter whether it was a lion, a tiger, or a bear. Oh my. But he would stand in the power, anointing, and covenant relationship with his heavenly father. Father, this week, as we face the giants that we have, God, we stand not in our strength, but the strength of the covenant-keeping God, the faithful one, the one who brings us into relationship forever. In Jesus' name, amen.